We've noted that nerve impulses are electrical in nature, but we've also noticed that of the hundreds of millions of nerve cells in the body, none of them touch. There is always a physical gap between the nerve cells. And this gap is the synapse. The synaptic gap. So let's imagine we have one neuron here. And at the end of that neuron, typically it's going to enlarge into a motor end bulb in the case of a motor neuron or the presynaptic neuron in other cases. There's going to be a wider end bit. And then before the next neuron, there is always this physical gap, very small, but it's definitely there. It's a physical gap before the next neuron. So this is the synaptic gap here. Not very big, but absolutely vital. In that context, this would be the presynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron before the synapse. This would be the postsynaptic neuron after the synapse. Now, let's suppose an electrical nerve impulse is traveling down the presynaptic neuron. We want the impulse to be able to get from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. That would be good. But in the same way that nerve impulses are either present or absence, the all or nothing position. Another fundamental principle of the way the nervous system works is one-way transmission. We only want the nerves to transmit the electrical nerve impulses in one direction. So we want it to go from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic, but suppose there's a bit of naughtiness or irregularity and an impulse starts coming up the wrong way in the presynaptic neuron. We don't want that impulse from the presynaptic neuron to be able to get to the, sorry, we don't want that impulse from the, from the postsynaptic neuron to get to the presynaptic neuron. So an impulse in the presynaptic we want to get to the postsynaptic, an impulse in the postsynaptic we do not want to get back to the presynaptic. The only direction of travel we want is this way. We don't want it to go back. And that's actually essentially what a synapse does. The synapse is essentially a valve. It will only allow the nerve impulse to travel in one direction. So from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic, yes. From the postsynaptic to the presynaptic, no. Now in the end part of the presynaptic neuron there's going to be some mitochondria to supply energy. Mitochondria supply energy. And then the key thing is in this presynaptic neuron there's going to be vesicles that contain chemical transmitter substance. And in the central nervous system especially there's a wide variety of these chemical transmitters. They're produced in the presynaptic neuron. So these vesicles, a vesicle is a fluid filled space with chemical transmitter. Now when a nerve impulse comes down the presynaptic neuron that will cause some of these vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So this membrane here, before the synapse, is the presynaptic membrane. That will release a chemical transmitter, which will then diffuse across the very microscopic synaptic gap. When that chemical transmitter reaches the postsynaptic membrane, when enough of it reaches it, it will cause that postsynaptic membrane to depolarize 
thereby generating a new wave of depolarization. So what we see is that there's electrical activity in the presynaptic neuron. The nerve impulse is propagated across the synaptic gap chemically via the chemical transmitter substance, whatever that happens to be. There's many different types. When the chemical transmitter gets to the postsynaptic membrane, that causes that to depolarize, generating a new electrical nerve impulse in the postsynaptic neuron, which will then carry on electrically. So we see the order of events is electrical transmission, chemical transmission, electrical transmission again. And as we said, if an impulse were to come the wrong way, if an impulse were to come up the postsynaptic neuron, which we don't want, there's no chemical transmitter in there, so it can't get the other way. So the synapse is ensuring one-way transmission from pre to post, but not from post to pre. Just like a valve, really. And if we look at this with a bit more, um, a bit more detail, <coughs> Let's imagine now that this is the presynaptic membrane here. That's the presynaptic membrane. And these are the vesicles of chemical transmitter in larger magnification. Now the chemical transmitter, whether it's GABA or whether it's glutamate or whether it's dopamine or serotonin or whatever it is, all of those things are specific molecules. So let's imagine the chemical transmitter here is serotonin. That is a molecule with a particular shape. Let's just imagine they're round. So what this vesicle actually contains, or what these presynaptic vesicles contain, is large amounts of individual serotonin molecules. When the electrical impulse arrives, these membranes can fuse. Releasing the serotonin molecules into the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft, some people will also call it. Now, on the postsynaptic membrane, there are chemical transmitter receptor sites, receptor molecules. And these receptor sites are designed to be a reciprocal shape for the chemical transmitters. So the chemical transmitter will fit into the postsynaptic membrane chemical transmitter receptor sites. And this is very much the lock and the key way of thinking, isn't it? The key is the chemical transmitter. The lock is the receptor site that it binds into. And it's only when the chemical transmitter binds into the receptor site that we're going to get the depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane and therefore propagation of the nerve impulse into the postsynaptic neuron. And again, if an impulse were to come the wrong way, <clears throat> not only is there no chemical transmitter here in the postsynaptic membrane, there's no receptor sites in the presynaptic membrane, so reverse transmission is impossible. So the chemical transmitters are released from the presynaptic vesicles, diffuse across the gap, bind into the postsynaptic membrane receptor molecules, and that's what causes the propagation of the new nerve impulse. Now in the neuromuscular junction, the chemical transmitter is acetylcholine. So if this was a muscle, and that was the end part of the motor neuron, that would be acetylcholine. 
Alternatively, this could be a synapse in the brain which wants to stimulate brain activity. And that could use a chemical transmitter called glutamate. So glutamate would stimulate neuronal activity. Alternatively, sometimes it's good to calm down and you want chemical transmitters that are inhibitory. And that would be GABA, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, the gamma amino butyric acid. GABA is the molecule that's acted on by the benzodiazepines that cause reduction in anxiety and calm you down because GABA is a calm you down sort of molecule. Other synapses use dopamine. Now dopamine is very important in mood and pleasure. When you think you're enjoying something, really you're not. It's just that the brain's releasing dopamine, giving you pleasurable impulses or pleasurable feelings. But it's the dopamine that generates the pleasurable impulses. So we see there's a variety of neurotransmitters. We've mentioned serotonin. Serotonin is very important for mood. <coughs> so if you're depressed, there may well be a lack of serotonin. We have particular medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And they prolong the life of the serotonin in the synaptic gap, causing more stimulation. So we see there's a variety of chemical transmitters that are active in the brain, generating various moods, emotions, and experiences.